I'm Simon and I'm the team leader of Policy Per Team, a team that is representing Institutes Per Technic and the University of Lisbon at the Air Cargo Challenge 2022. We are a group of students that design, build and fly optimized UAVs. We have about 19 years of history and have been participating since the first edition of this competition in 2003. The team is organized in six different departments, respectively aerodynamics, wing structure, style, fuselage, electronics and marketing. Our work for Air Cargo Challenge 2022 was initiated when the regulations were published about two years ago. We have started with, with several brainstormings to define the conceptual design of the UAV, which have been really challenging compared to what we have done in previous years. Firstly, because the payload for these editions are blood bags with an eye volume, we should create a larger fuselage that contains this payload and connects together all the aircraft components. On the other hand, we have realized that the biggest limitation to the airplane's geometry was the rumble's box where it must fit in, rather than the transportation box like in previous years. Unfortunately, the air cargo challenge was delayed one year due to the COVID pandemic, but we have decided to build a first prototype anyway. This prototype was used to prove some design concepts and test composite manufacturing methods. During the last academic year, we did a second iteration of the design of the aircraft to further optimize it, which started with some propulsive tests. Our first responsibility was to determine the thrust generated by the motor, so we could start designing the airplane. Therefore, we conducted wind tunnel tests uh, for the different propellers with the motor specified by the competition regulation. We used different batteries for different air velocities. Regarding the test results, we decided that the 5000 mAh battery was optimal because it managed to keep a good performance throughout the flight and wasn't too heavy for the airplane. For the propeller, the choice was the Aeronaut because it performed slightly better for lower speeds. Finally, we managed to uh, plot a function with the time and velocity of the air as input and thrust of the motor as an output. We used these to optimize our design of the aircraft. Our first approach was to develop a MATLAB program which tests many possible configurations with varying aerodynamic design parameters and chooses, based on some approximations and typical values, the one that would win the competition in this punctuation system. Simultaneously, a sub-team was developing a genetic algorithm to choose a wing airfoil. At this point, we had the airfoil chosen and the general parameters for the wing, such as area, mean core, taper ratio and the angle for the rumbus box that were applied to an elliptical wing. This first iteration was studied in XFLR5 and CFD to confirm that it accomplished the requirements and expectations and a V-tail was designed so the aircraft was stable. Several initial tails were designed. The most promising ones were iterated on and the tail that had the least drag while still meeting our design and stability criteria was chosen. During this phase, stall studies led to the introduction of geometric twists. The control surfaces were designed last. Calculations and theoretical studies were used to estimate the minimum acceptable aileron area. The flaps were as big as possible to add flight options and the tail control surfaces were estimated with typical VTAIL values. We used this first iteration for several tests and confirmations. Two internal models were built, the first one to study the precision of the methods used and a second one with control surfaces to confirm the deflection derivatives of the airfoil and replaceable winglets to test different design effectivenesses. Flight tests were also carried out, where both pilot feedback and sensor information were imperative for the development of the second aircraft iteration. We found that some details, such as the landing gear, were imperative for good performance. The second iteration had the same steps as the first one, but with improved data, estimations and designs. To increase performance, winglets were introduced, with help from CFD. The tail was made elliptical and geometric twist was replaced with aerodynamic twists, by creating a new genetic airfoil to be paired with the first one. Dihedral was also introduced for stability. To test the second iteration, the team moved to new internal confirmation tests with a more accurate model and new flight tests. Right after the last edition of Air Cargo Challenge, the wing structure team decided to invest in some optimization programs to reduce the overall weight of the wing structure. Analyzing results from the optimization programs, we started finding some characteristics of the internal structure, the number and position of the ribs, and the thickness of the shell. To maximize the specific strength of the structure, we opt for composite materials for almost all parts of it. Our skin is reinforced with a very low fiberglass and both spar and uh, ribs are made with balsa wood and carbon fiber. To deepen our understanding of the wing stress, we develop a fan model with the wall structure integrated. 
that allow us to optimize and remove weight without compromising its rectal integrity. With this analysis, we concluded that the shell had an important role in the torsion of the wing, and positioning the fiber at 45 degrees helped with that. Due to the limitations in the transportation box, we had to split the wings in two parts. Therefore, we had to come up with a solution to connect the parts with the fuselage. We decided to use the main spar as a connection. The main male spar passes through the fuselage and connects to the female spar in both sections of the wing. Due to the rectangular section of the spar, we had to manufacture the, this connection. We also decided to use two carbon fiber tubes that fit in each side of the wing to reduce the torsion. We create pins to embed the tubes inside the wing and inside the fuselage. Finally, for the control surface of the wing, we develop a mechanism that fits inside the wing. This mechanism still allows replacing the service and reduces parasitic drag. We received the data for the new model from the aerodynamics team and we were quite pleased to see that we could finally build an elliptical VTL, which was something we had wanted for some time. Although this is a more complex geometry and therefore we had to use a different building technique than what we were used to, we are confident the extra effort was worth it. The current TILS 3D CADs began as a recruitment project for the then newcomers. The recruits took on that challenge with a big enthusiasm and a big learning curve as well. The whole team learned a lot of CAD solutions and tools uh, through many brainstorming sessions and the exchange of knowledge between older and younger members. Some of the most interesting design decisions we made were 3D printing a stringer connection piece to mount on the tail boom, which had to guarantee both a safe coupling and an easy removal. We were also under the indication to tilt the stabilizers at a two and a half degree angle, uh, which at first was quite the challenge understanding how to implement it, but once we decided to keep the internal structure in its original position and tilt only the outer surface, uh, everything became much simpler. We used uh, an appendix, a 3D printed appendix to the mold to ensure a proper alignment of all the parts along with some indentations and other marks in the mold. After Olisip's last model, we saw there was a need to pay closer attention to the landing gear and that there was no information gathered by Olisip on this matter. This way, the tail team became the tail and landing gear team and several prototypes and structural analysis later, uh, the design for our landing gear was born. This was a really big opportunity uh, to learn and explore, uh, such as how to build and optimize our own wheels rather than just buying them. One of the landing gear's crucial points of study is its linkage to the cargo bay. We needed simple but reliable connections that would not only allow the access to the transportation box, but also allow us to repair or replace the landing gear in case it gets too damaged, so we went with the good old plates and screws. Regarding the design of the fuselage compared to previous models, we changed it and adapted it to be larger in order to meet the new requirements for this year's competition. This new configuration caused an increase in complexity and also more dependence of the other teams in relation to ours, especially when deciding the fittings and wing sizing. Also, we calculated the center of mass of the airplane to determine the position of the wing. Besides, the fuselage has a great influence on the flow around the wing and the tail, so we performed some aerodynamic analysis to guarantee the best aerodynamic design. First, we studied the best method of placing the payload and the best location for the opening lids, in order to avoid the center of mass from moving. Then, we had to optimize the space reserved for the electronics and the engine, so that everything can fit inside without problems. Finally, we had some issues with materials that didn't adapt well to more complex and aerodynamic shapes, so we tested new ones that resulted in variation in mass and resistance. After all, our main objective was to guarantee the structural integrity of the fuselage during landing and ensure a good connection with the landing gear in order to avoid problems for aerodynamics. Our biggest challenge was to respond to other teams when the design of the fuselage itself depends on their work. Taking in consideration what we had learned from our previous airplane models, the team decided to execute a mold-based construction method in order to facilitate the composite manufacturing. Whether they were wood-based or 3D printed molds, we found that this was a much more reliable procedure given the consistency it provides for the shells and other components that it helps to create. These molds have to be treated in order to produce shells with a smooth surface finish. We start by sanding and polishing them, applying release wax and protecting its several surfaces which are not meant to be in contact with the composite we manufacture them in. One of the most interesting characteristics implemented on our molds is how it accommodates for each component's internal structure, be it the wings, tail, 
fuselage or even landing gear. As previously mentioned, indentations, appendixes, uh, pins and other marks were designed and developed to ensure every piece fits exactly where it has to. This was a significant improvement, particularly for the tail team, since the previous stabilizers were cut off foam and therefore it was a lot harder to access its internal components. For the wing and fuselage, it made it much easier to place the main spar in the correct location, making sure the alignment between these two components is perfect. Once the molds are ready, it's time to start the composite and layer process. Although the fuselage and landing gear are made of different fibers and core from the wings and tail, the building processes are very similar. After having decided on many layers of each face to incorporate for a specific component in question, the fiber sheets are laid upon the treated mold, then a foam, irex or wood core is placed, and lastly the rest of the fiber sheets, with all of these sets being permeated with epoxy resin. Another technique used for components like spars is rolling the resin permeated fiber sheets around the core. Afterwards, these composites are cured in vacuum or in some cases in a normal environment. Adjusting the fiber sheets to the shapes of the mold or even rolling them around the core is definitely a challenge to overcome, especially in crucial areas like the leading edges and the area where the landing gear is linked to the fuselage. There were also used some unidirectional carbon fiber strips in the wings and in the landing gear to increase the strength in the areas where the stresses are higher. Electronics are fundamental for our RC plane and although we don't build the electrical components ourselves, they still have to be very well planned and placed throughout our model. Therefore, the construction phase has to always have in accordance to our electrical overview. The battery that powers the secondary circuit is a 650 mAh 2S LiPo battery directly connected to the receiver. The receiver gets inputs from the GPS-like position, altitude and airspeed, which are right away transmitted to the controller delivering all the important information to the pilot. Through the antennas, it also obtains the signals from the controller needed to adjust the servos that actuate in the control surfaces. The radio controller was programmed in order to have multiple modes for flap deployment or control surfaces sensitivity. Last but not least, everything must be assembled, every final detail must be accounted and the airplane must pass a structural test designed to ensure a safe and successful flight. In the assembly, it is important to ensure that all the components fit together, especially between the wings and the fuselage, to grant a tight fit and a good transmission of the forces and end moments between the components. This stage is when we do all the last trims to the fittings. Therefore, the final assembly is a critical step. Not only because after finished we get closer to flying our airplane, but mainly because it determines how well it will perform in flight. We've crashed our plane in one of our test flights and that led to a lot of subsequent hard work in order to rebuild it in time for the competition. But we don't consider this to have been a loss. In fact, it proved to be essential in detecting several flaws to be corrected and details to be improved.